He's spoken at conferences. Spoken? Is that a deal? I don't know. But he's spoken at conferences all around the world. He has a master's degree in nutritional sciences. He's worked with tons and tons of clients. He is the founder of Sigma Nutrition Radio, Danny Lennon. So the first topic I'd like to start with here is chrononutrition. And from my understanding is this this is a pretty interesting topic for you. So I think a good starting place is kind of starting with what it is and maybe how you kind of got interested in this topic. Sure. So um, chrononutrition essentially relates to how our timing of our meals and nutrient ingestion may relate to circadian biology. So circadian rhythms is probably a term some people may have heard of and it's essentially talking about these rhythms that happen within the body over a roughly 24-hour span and it's slightly different to an exact 24-hour timing but essentially it's, it's around that time um, and so these, these rhythms that run on a kind of night uh, are, are typical day length um, and are most strongly influenced by the night and dark or so the dark and light cycles my interest kind of grew before this was really talked about with nutrition. So if you look at a lot of the circadian biology stuff, it's kind of really well known about like light exposure, uh, the timing of that, how that influences some of these rhythms of, say, various different hormones. One of the most well-known that people may have came across before is when people are talking about uh, melatonin. And you see this kind of natural rhythm throughout the day where you would want peaking upwards and you can disrupt that if you have exposure to artificial light or particularly like the blue and green wavelengths of light at the wrong time. So at nighttime, looking into your iPad or your iPhone, the reason why that is problematic and why people recommend not to do it is because that can disrupt some of this, uh, the, this circadian rhythm that we have with melatonin. And that's just one example of pretty much an infant number of things that are happening within the body that can run on these diurnal patterns. So whilst light and dark are those biggest influencers and why it's good to get daylight exposure early in the day and then limit artificial light late at night, there are other things that can influence the circadian rhythms in certain organs around the body. So probably one part that's important to, to step to first is that we have what is kind of colloquially called a master clock. So this is a biological clock that's at the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is kind of in, in the brain. And that kind of regulates most of this. This is the master orchestrator for a lot of these rhythms. However, we also have a number of peripheral clocks in different tissues and organs around the body. And it seems that, at least uh, mechanistically from certain data we have now, that other things outside of light and dark can affect this. So, for example, exercise has been one. But the one that uh, we're talking about with chrononutrition is how meal timing and exposure to nutrients can affect some of these peripheral clocks and essentially can help synchronize them, uh, have them in sync or maybe desynchronize them and if we eat at particular times. And so this whole field of chrononutrition is looking at how meal timing essentially affects some of these peripheral clocks and how that in turn influences our health. And uh, as I'm sure we'll get to, there's probably a number of different things that seem to be regulated in, in this kind of circadian manner when it comes to nutrient absorption, um, when it comes down to like gastric emptying, when it comes down to certain hormones that are going to be related to, to food being able to metabolize fat and carbohydrates seem to be different at different times of the day. And so this field is like, is there is it the best time to partition more of our calories to a certain time of day and so on. And so that's the, what the general field is. And uh, it's probably a bit lengthy answer, but I think that's worthwhile uh, just to kind of clarify some of the terms we're kind of going to be talking about. Right. And in terms of the effects that this has, I, I know I've had Dr. Emily Manugian on the podcast and she is really interested in how it affects sleep, but it's it's kind of news to me that there's also different like absorption rates of different nutrients, what it sounds like at different times of the day. So could you kind of go into that a little bit deeper on how how when you eat might affect absorption and how it might affect different things like that? Sure. So I should probably start with the caveat that 
we still don't have a ton of like really high quality human data in this area. A lot of it is has been mechanistic, or is, a lot has also been done in rodents and other animal models. Um, there are human trials that have been done and are underway, and they look quite promising, which is why I think I hold a lot of interest in this area. But mechanistically, at least, it seems that uh, one example is, and that's often done in shift workers, is if you see people eating in the middle of the night, the their ability to uh, metabolize carbohydrate and fats can be poorer than it would at a different time of day, even eating the same sized meal. So that means that their blood glucose is going to stay higher for longer or uh, free fatty acids in the bloodstream may stay higher for longer because you have this poor uh, response being able to metabolize those. And so what that is suggesting is that even if we control for the type and amount of food you're eating over a 24 hour period, when you eat it may influence some of these health markers. Now, there's a couple of questions from that. One is, how transient is that, say, elevation in some of these things? Does that persist long-term, and what long-term health impacts does that have? Uh, on a kind of related note that's worth mentioning is when we're talking specifically about body composition, I would still feel that most likely if you are matching your daily food intakes to the exact same number of calories, macronutrients, and your activity is the same, then really the timing shouldn't matter from a purely uh, body composition perspective, at least in that acute term. Now, in free-living subjects, they have been able to show that meal timing may influence someone's body composition over the long run. Uh, so by eating more in alignment, let's say, with your circadian rhythms, does that mean that people are going to end up uh, eating less? Is it going to mean that they're going to have higher energy expenditure across the day? These are some of the things that we're trying to work out right now. But definitely, it seems that it can play a beneficial role even for body weight uh, in a kind of non-controlled setting. When, so when you don't control for total calories. Some work has um, suggested even in isochloric conditions, it can have a benefit. But um, again, there may be other mechanistic reasons for that. So for right now, I think it's probably we're more looking at this from a, a health perspective of some of the things that are going to drive metabolic dysfunction, um, that lead to metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, these types of things, can that be influenced by when we're eating? And so I guess to kind of jump to the punchline of, well, where are we? What timing are we actually talking about? There's probably a few things that seem to be relatively clear, at least mechanistically right now. One is that the consistency of your meal timing probably has some role. So rather than eating randomly and sporadically from day to day, so at different times each day, and you kind of know set routine, that's probably going to be suboptimal compared to having regular meal times from, from a day-to-day -day basis. The same way that whilst getting eight hours of sleep is good, it seems that it's probably more beneficial if you have a regular wake time and sleep time that is consistent across the whole week as opposed to each day radically changing and one day you sleeping from 12 p.m to 8 a.m and another day you sleeping from 4 a.m until 4 a.m and that is my subject to, yeah to uh, <laughs> uh 12 p.m mm -hmm. so 4 a.m to 12 p.m and so you're both still getting eight uh, hours but you are it's kind of this radical difference in when mm -hmm. you're sleeping. So it seems that it can be the same with meal timing. Um, again, the question is how much of an effect, but it seems that there is probably something there to having consistent meal times. Um, then the other would be that trying to eat, let's say, within daylight hours. So just avoiding eating really late at night, um, particularly if this gets into the, the middle of the night when you're usually asleep. So this is one of the issues you see with shift workers, for example, when they change shift and now they're going to have a large meal at, let's say, 4 a.m. in the morning. That can, again, be dealt with the body drastically different than on a, a normal feeding time previous to going on that shift. And so you eat that meal, but again, like we talked about earlier, you can have elevations in free fatty acids and glucose and so on. So... Uh, Trying to eat within kind of daylight hours is probably a general rule of thumb. And then the kind of third part of it that's 
being kind of hypothesized based on these mechanisms is probably biasing more of your energy intake to the earlier part of the day. So it doesn't mean you need to have a super huge breakfast as soon as you wake up, but it just means in general, in that first half of the day, for example, probably having a decent chunk of your calories and probably going lighter the, the longer it gets into the day. So your evening or kind of later meals in the day, probably being a bit lighter compared to what you've taken in earlier. And the, uh, as we'll probably talk about for kind of some of this pragmatically, the difficulty with that is probably it's what the opposite of most people end up doing just naturally for lifestyle reasons, social reasons, and so on. It, particularly if people enjoy eating in the evening and they're relaxing from the TV, that's where you're going to want to eat. So uh, many people will probably go lighter on a breakfast or skip breakfast to save up calories. Um, or people just are going to come home in the evening and have a late dinner with their family because it's the only time they can get together and so on. So from a pragmatic perspective, it could be different, but purely mechanistically, those are things that are being hypothesized and trying to work out right now. And actually, there's a, there's a couple of groups in the UK, uh, one in Surrey and one up in Aberdeen in Scotland, who are doing quite a lot of work in this area of looking at uh, meal timing and this kind of biasing of calories to earlier or later in the day. Um, and these are some of the things they're trying to work out of that old adage of uh, eating breakfast like a king and supper like a pauper. Is, is there something to that? And potentially with uh, this kind of relationship with circadian biology, that may be useful. Um, so a bias to earlier in the day, food intake probably in daylight hours instead of super late at night and then probably consistency of timing. There are the things that are we're, we're seeing generally maybe beneficial. Mm. Yeah, I was definitely thinking as you were going there, man, this this kind of sounds like the opposite of what the regular everyday person does. It's usually like, oh, maybe I'll grab something for breakfast as I'm running out the door. I'll pack a light lunch. And then when I get home in the afternoon or evening, that's when I'm going to eat all my food. And from from this right. standpoint, it sounds like for for health, anyways, that could have some, maybe not the best implications. Yeah. So the thing I would be careful of is is that if we're talking about someone eating the same amount of food and doing the same activity, then is there some amount of benefit to eating in the manner I just described? Yeah, potentially. But in the case where we say that someone is going to be eating later in the evening or is going to have to eat uh, those kind of meals um, because they have a family at home or the only way they can control their total caloric intake is by having a small breakfast or skipping breakfast altogether to essentially save those calories. Which one would they be better doing? Well, in that case, having they are probably going to have better health outcomes in the long term if they're not consistently overeating on calories. So it's no good to say, yeah, have more calories at breakfast if that's going to mean they're going to eat more calories over the day mm -hmm. it's going to be too much so uh, and plus from just a, a, a purely kind of psychological perspective if that's inducing a lot of stress then how how much worth it is it that's what we have to kind of work out so for example some of the studies that were pretty cool showed benefit for uh, body composition and other certain health outcomes when they gave people a cutoff I think it was pretty early it was like maybe 2 or 3 p.m. in the day. Wow. Uh, I think it could be 2 p.m. So they didn't have to try and stick to a certain number of calories or a certain number of meals, but they would finish their eating by 2 p.m. And that group has lots of benefits, like I said, for both body composition and health. Now, the thing is, how realistic is that as an intervention to suggest to people? Right? Like, How likely is it we're going to get pretty much anyone that's going to be able to do that? Sure, for some people, they can do it if they have that total freedom. But as we know, if someone has, uh, like they have a regular social life where they're going to meet in friends, you're not going to be going out for a burger with friends probably before 2 <laughs> p.m. most times um, or having a beer in the evening or even just a family dinner uh, at nighttime. So there is that difficulty of how do we put that into practice? So it's probably going to be more an aspect of it doesn't have to be this really early cutoff. Um, but just being kind of mindful of things like eating super late at night is probably not going to be the best. And can we slowly over time make 
more and more changes in this direction. Uh, but yeah, I totally agree. And and just to kind of circle back to my first point, because I think it is important for people to to uh, get is that we have a hierarchy of things that are important with your nutrition for both your health, but also maintaining a uh, body composition that actually helps your health in the long run. So for that, knowing the things that have the biggest impact, so for example, your overall caloric intake, the amount of protein and carbohydrate and fat you're eating, your overall food quality, these are your big picture stuff. If by trying to eat in a quote unquote optimal circadian way, means that you don't do those things correctly or not as well as you were previously doing, then it's kind of counter uh, productive. So the first place is what dietary setup will allow you to do those big picture things correctly first. What type of diet allows you to generally eat good food in an appropriate amount most of the time? That should be kind of your default. And then if some of these uh, changes to a more, let's say, circadian friendly manner are easy for you to implement and you can do over time, then you're probably just adding to the benefit potentially. So I wouldn't do it to the point of sacrificing those big picture things. So your total food quality, total uh, energy you're taking in, the macronutrients that you're consuming, those kind of core fundamentals of your diet, as well as a dietary strategy that you're going to be able to adhere to for long enough for it to be beneficial. So if it counteracts any of those, it's probably not worth jumping straight into right now. But if over time you can add some of these elements without any real stress or anxiety or putting unnecessary pressure on yourself, then that's possible, right? So if you typically eat have a habit of eating really late at night now, maybe you can pull that back by a couple of hours and give yourself a cutoff earlier in the evening is that still tolerable you can still eat with your family all that type of stuff but it's just not super late at night maybe if you just eat sporadically now and have no kind of schedule uh, so to speak for your meals maybe it's trying to generally get relatively consistent across the week it doesn't have to be the exact same time but roughly each day that your breakfast happens at the same time and then your dinner happens at the same time may be something useful and again, they're going to have small impacts, but maybe in the long run, they can actually be useful. Uh, but yeah, just not doing at the uh, sacrifice of those big picture things and doing something that is just too difficult psychologically that doesn't fit with you and is just going to promote stress or probably avoid against. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's a good way of going about things, especially considering like we don't have a ton of evidence in athletes as well and a lot of people listening to this are probably lifting weights you know three or four days a week and we kind of we have a pretty dang good idea of the big rocks for some athletes you know total energy balance macronutrient intake that sort of thing and with this stuff yes it probably is has that little added effect but like you said not at the expense of these other things. And I really like how you brought up how your social life can impact it too, because we're starting to learn more and more how your social life has an impact on stress, health, and potentially even body composition over the long run. So not sacrificing mm. those things is probably a really good idea. Absolutely. I, I was only talking with a, a friend the other day about this kind of, this whole thing about uh, community, feeling like you belong in a certain group, social interactions with close friends and family, as well as just your interactions with strangers on a day-to-day -day basis, all these aspects that give you this feeling of community support, belonging, like how they are tied to long-term health outcomes is so incredible when you look at some of the data. It, it's just insane. Um, and we were actually talking about, there's a book called Tribe by Sebastian Younger. Mm -hmm. um, if, if people have, haven't read that, it's, it's an awesome book that touches on some of these same ideas. And you see, yeah, it's not disconnected. Like it's so strongly connected to health in more than pretty much anything. Like social isolation is one of the high, biggest risk factors you could have for so many chronic illnesses. And so, yeah, if you're shying away for those reasons, it's probably not going to be useful. And it kind of reminds me just talking of athletes. Uh, one of our coaches at Sigma, a really good friend of mine, uh, Kiran, we, we've talked a lot about this before. He's been an S&C coach for a lot of uh, rugby teams. And we've kind of talked about experiences as athletes and him in his coaching role and seeing that 
even things that might look like not good for your health or performance in an acute setting can have a benefit in the long term if they help with things like stress, social bonding, and so on. And his example is often for those rugby teams of after matches or on certain days going out as a team, drinking alcohol and, and being together that, yeah, sure, drinking alcohol doesn't improve your performance and it probably doesn't improve your health. And you could think, I want to be a super serious athlete, so I'm going to do none of that stuff. But if you're in a setting where you you have that experience and now you're bonding with your teammates, having fun, just the relaxation it gives when you're just enjoying yourself, you're de-stressing a bit, then that can help you in the long run probably be a healthier and more balanced athlete. And so that's one example that kind of speaks to that, that we tend to get a narrow focus on everything uh, from body composition to performance, et cetera, and not realize that there's this bigger picture of things that can help you be an overall healthier human being. If you're overall healthier human being, you're probably going to be a better athlete as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Health is probably a necessity for long-term athletic success and that sort of thing. And I really like what you said about not getting so narrowly focused on one thing, because I almost feel like some people can get really narrowly focused on even like muscle protein synthesis to where all they think about is what's the MPS response after a meal. And like you said, with, with alcohol, probably not a great idea for muscle protein synthesis, but if going out and having a few drinks totally drops your stress levels and you can have a social life with people, then over the long run, that's probably going to be more beneficial than completely avoiding everything all the time. Right, for sure. Yeah, and you see a lot of, of the top athletes and coaches kind of talk about similar things like this. And um, I remember talking to Bryce Lewis before about, uh, on a kind of similar note that, that just reminded me of as you were talking about that, um, and I was talking to, to someone yesterday even about this same uh, topic of, if you put all of your eggs essentially in one basket of only thinking about, say, lifting, so Bryce is a power lifter, if it's everything in his life is oriented just about lifting and performance and lifting, then you are very susceptible to negative emotions that may arise when something goes wrong. So, for example, if he gets injured or has a poor training day or a poor meet, then that is going to be much more catastrophic than if he has mental resources gone into these other areas of his life that he still has other hobbies. He still has these strong, uh, connections with, uh, other people, his friends, these, these groups they can belong to and puts investment into those. Then you're, I think, less susceptible to some of those downsides. And the same thing probably applies here. If, if you do everything and sacrifice every single thing just for performance in one thing, then if you don't perform, then it, it's going to be much more damaging than if you have, I suppose, spread that across a few other domains where even when you're having a tough time right now with your performance, you still have these other areas that you've been paying attention to as well. Yeah, I think I can definitely see that to where a lot of people get especially really like emotionally attached to their training to where they have one day to where they just perform suboptimally, it will literally like ruin their entire day. And part of that probably is because of that just myopic focus on bodybuilding and things like that. And I think especially in when you're just trying to, you're in the gym and you're just trying to look better and maybe you don't have necessarily like super highly competitive aspirations, making sure that you're not just so myopic on this one thing and getting totally emotionally attached to everything probably a pretty good idea yeah and i think to a certain degree for, for high level performance people do have to be obviously like super interested mm -hmm. in it uh, sometimes bordering on the point of obsession but knowing where that cutoff is of like yeah you can go in to the, to the gym and just be completely obsessed with what you're going to do that day but having a cutoff of when you're leaving that, okay that's that done and now i need to be able to function in these other areas of my life and be able to derive joy from those. And that that's funny because it's on top of my mind. I was listening to a, a podcast the other day with uh, Steve Kerr. So I was a coach at Golden State Warriors for people who don't follow the NBA. And he was talking about how they have like these fundamental values as a team that are what everything relates back to. And he says the most important of them that they had decided on was joy. And he says that's what everything has to come back to of 
has mm. to feed into this value of joy. And he says, that's why you can see someone like Steph Curry, who he's out on the court and it looks like he's just playing around with his friends. And he's laughing and joking, but they're in the middle of a playoff game and it's a, a, a tight playoff game. And he's there laughing and smiling and like doing just crazy stuff because he's like super relaxed and he's got that joy for that game. And it's um, obviously a thing that takes a lot of training over time, but it's just to be, I suppose, to feedback and remember why we do these certain things, right? And they're there to enhance our life, not to make it worse. So if the thing we're so passionate about is making our life worse, then it's probably not a good thing. Uh, We want it to make it better. So we should be able to do it and still enjoy life, I guess, is the kind of punchline. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And is there in, in, in your coaching, is there anything that you do to try to kind of build this more community aspect? Like I know uh, online coaching, it's probably a little bit more difficult to build that community aspect. I mean, it could just be educating clients on, hey, be aware that your social life matters for all this stuff too and to kind of have that mindset mm. or how do you kind of approach yeah, that? That's a good question. So I, I don't think it's anything that's a structured technique or tip. It's simply about having empathy as a coach and how that is just the fundamental to any aspect of coaching of realizing that what's probably even more important than any specific recommendation you give as a coach is how you communicate and interact and listen to someone. And if someone is, gets the sense that their coach really listens to them and takes in what they're saying and values that doesn't judge them for it and is there to really try and help then that's going to be far more useful to them in terms of sticking around long enough, putting enough effort in, being receptive to feedback Mm. rather than any specific thing you say. Because a lot of the time, most clients probably do know certain habits and behaviors they would like to have or they should have to be successful. It's they need that supportive environment. So I think a lot of it comes down to just basic empathy of really trying to care about that, that person as a person and taking a, a probably a, a more of an overview rather than, again, like we said, a narrow focus. So, for example, if we're coaching someone with nutrition, it's not going to be as useful if all we look at is specifically just what they're eating. So getting them to send us a food diary with no other interaction and us giving feedback on that food diary isn't coaching, right? It's not the same coaching that we do. So I'm lucky to have coaches that, that work for me that are, that are really excellent people um, that can really communicate well, that are empathetic, that care about people. And our clients get that. And so it's rather that most of the coaching ends up being things that are non-nutrition almost, right? It's, it's an overall, I don't want to say the term life coach, but kind of yeah, coaching around that person's life or not telling them what to do with their life, but more listening to what's going on. Mm-hmm. And when they're, you listen to what's going on and you can kind of make these connections of why certain things are happening and people get that, that support is probably going to be worth more to them and allow them to make better nutrition decisions in turn, right? If someone is a overall more emotionally healthy person and feels supported and cared for, then making good nutrition decisions, good exercise decisions, good sleep decisions is much more easy then trying to do those same things, but if you're in a place where like you're super anxious about stuff, you're super stressed out, you don't feel support or connected. And so being able to provide that can have an indirect effect on those other things. So yeah, we put it down to just simple kind of like empathy, communication, and putting a lot of time into thinking through those things and maybe trying to learn around those things. And as for reminding people of what's important, we would try and do that so often so you can look for patterns of their thinking and what they're saying in a check-in and if it seems particularly um too obsessive about a certain thing that can be problematic or just as they're you're chatting through stuff reminding them of the important stuff that's going on um and right now i'm actually in, in melbourne uh, my friend Jacob has a, a gym here and we were talking the other day about kind of social media and he made a really good point of how he's been able to use social media interaction with some of his coaching clients in that exact manner you say of being able to look out for if they're exhibiting poor behaviors around things. So for example, he, he coaches a lot of uh, bodybuilders, um, 
both male and female. And during particular times, if they're connected on, say, Instagram, he can start to see if they're overly focused on all they're posting about is food and like everything is like super, super food focused. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to pull back on this. We're getting a bit too focused on, on these things. Let's limit it to this frequency and the rest of the time focus on other stuff. So that was a kind of really cool way when I heard him say that because it's essentially trying to pull people back from that point and being able to get, put their attention and focus on a different area. Right. Yeah. I think, Man, sometimes I go back and forth thinking whether social media is a net positive or net negative. And I think it's about how you use it. And I think if you use it in a way to be a better coach and do that sort of thing, then that's totally great. And I think those are some really good strategies to kind of build, Not maybe not necessarily that, well, yeah, yeah that community, because if you have that emotional intelligence to have that empathy with a client and stuff like that, that is building some of that community and is probably going to help with that long-term success, especially considering this whole diet and training thing. It's your entire lifestyle. It's, it's all encompass, all encompassing. Yeah. And that's, it's, that's something I've really struggled with myself because I'm generally kind of an anti-social media person, uh, particularly Instagram. I found is probably (laughs) one of the most damaging for people. Um, but I, oftentimes I'm reminded of some of those benefits that it has of people who have been able to connect with the right people to help them because of social media, people that have came across good information because of social media, people who are in Facebook support groups that have been really beneficial and supported them. And now they feel like a a group of friends. Um, Beyond that, people being able to find other like-minded people that can be part of their tribe now that they never would have otherwise, right? They live in a rural area, small town, no one really the same interests. Now, because of the internet, you can go into a, no matter how small and tiny your niche interest is, you can find people of that, that same values. And now you have a group to belong to. So there's plenty of positives. And I always have to kind of concede those to people that there is a lot of good that can be done. And as you say, how you use it. Um, I think it's probably more of a issue for people who don't ever consider how they're using social media, what mm-hmm. their social media habits are like, and not realizing a few key things. This could be a whole other rant I can get into, but like just, just the basic thing of like Instagram is not reality. And it's, it's just impossible to be, even if like I never try and post fake stuff on Instagram. But as I said to someone yesterday, if someone looked through my Instagram, they would probably have a different perception of my life of what it actually is. Right. Yeah. It just, it's all these like this highlight reel and it just can't be reality. And the weird thing about it is you can say that to someone and pretty much everyone will agree with you. If, if I said, look, you do realize that Instagram is not in any way like reality. Not only is these just highlight clips, a lot of the time some of this stuff is fake, right? There, it's like, it's lighting, filters, it's Photoshop, like that stuff. But even if you take all of that out and have real photos that people, and real experiences people are having, that's just a snapshot that gives you an idea that these other people are always really happy, or always in really good shape, or always good, and it's just not real. And most people are like, yeah, I get that, it's not real, I know a lot of it's fake, blah, blah, blah. But, 10 minutes later, if they go through their feed, they will immediately get these negative feelings and it happens so often. And it's almost this thing that can't be avoided. And it just gives this negative uh, emotion to a lot of people, um, even without realizing how it's affecting them. Some people may feel it doesn't affect them at all, but it is subconsciously it's affecting them of comparisons to other people, of their self-worth, all this type of stuff. So I think, yeah, it's just a really tricky one. It's, um, it's being aware of that and then maybe trying to put things in place to prevent yourself from falling into those traps and just being aware if, if you go into it certain times, does it make you feel better or worse than when you went on? Mm -hmm. If it's making you feel worse, then well, maybe first check the people you're following. Like if you go into someone's page consistently because they're a big superstar to you, but it makes you feel bad, then just don't follow those people. So, yeah, like I said, that could be a whole other rant on social media, but like, that's just my general consensus now that I do see there's good. I do see there's a lot of bad. I don't know what to do about it because (laughs) it's not going anywhere. So, uh, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. I have very similar opinions there. And I think the awareness factor of 
not realizing how it's affecting you is something that is really difficult for people and definitely has been difficult for myself in the past as well. I remember, I don't know, earlier on in college, I'd be watching somebody on YouTube and then I didn't even realize that I'm constantly comparing my life to their highlight reel. And then it just, yep. you almost don't even realize that how it's making you feel and it can just really have yeah. a negative impact. But I don't want to come off saying that I'm totally like anti-social media because like you said, there's some good things about it as well. Right. Yeah. And it obviously affects some people more than others. And there's probably certain demographics that are more susceptible to the negative aspect of it. And I think um, just for anyone that's in kind of interest in this area, Jonathan Haidt has kind of talked about this quite a lot. Um, he's some, look at some really good research on it. When you look at the statistics on particularly uh, teenage girls, so the younger they are and the earlier they've had the exposure to social media, um, can obviously influence them a lot differently than it would for someone in their thirties, right? Um, just because of how it's being used and how susceptible they are to some of that messaging and comparing to other people. And, uh, yeah, so I think there's definitely an individual aspect to it, but the interesting thing is when people hear that, they often think, yeah, other people have a, like I'm really negatively affected by it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that's not me, but most of the time it is. I think most people, like you say, don't realize how it's affecting them. Um, and it would probably be interesting if everyone took like at least like seven days, like with zero social media and just see how they felt. Cause then they would know if it was affecting them in a beneficial way or not. Uh, but that's pretty tough to do. So uh, yeah, I think starting with awareness and just being aware and know how it's affecting you is, is trying is worth trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of people that are like, Hey, I can, I can get five or six hours of sleep every night and feel just fine. And then they get eight hours of sleep and they're like, oh right, my yeah. God, my life has changed. Oh, shit, yeah. 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 I can never have five hours again. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It definitely a interesting topic to discuss, but we'll, we'll wrap this thing for the listeners here back around to nutrition and the next kind of yeah, place. Probably a good idea. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm, I think most people or a lot of people that are interested in educating themselves are interested in this sort of thing as well. So I think we'll be at least cool. somewhat all right there, but yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about whatever as, as long as uh, I'm not bringing a fossil on, up on tangents and stuff. So oh, that's all right. I totally enjoy yeah. it. So <laughs> the next thing I'd like to kind of move into is what do you think that are some things that people maybe, maybe even outside of just purely like physiological things. So like a lot of people probably understand at least that are probably watching this, energy balance. Yeah, that's important for fat loss and things like that. But there's some other probably considerations before starting X diet plan or X thing. And what do you think that people are some of the most important things people might want to consider before starting like a dieting phase or a way of eating or something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I did a, a seminar the other day and I had a, a slide that essentially talked about this where people can almost from the starting point have a checklist of things to work through of where do I, where do I start? What's the first thing to address? And then the first thing I'd put up there is asking the question, do I have a good relationship with food? And if the answer is no, then stop there and let's address that. If the answer is yes, then we can go the next thing down that checklist. And so this can be a difficult one because, uh, in some cases it's, it's obvious if someone has, uh, a eating disorder, a pattern of disordered eating in the past has quite obvious things that they're already aware of, then they can either have already been working with someone on that or can be talked to someone about it or be referred to a specialist if they need to. For other people, it, as we've talked about in the last point, it might not be as obvious. And so it's to really trying to dig in, well, do I have a good relationship with food? Uh, Beyond that, probably even other areas like do I have a good uh, relationship with myself in terms of body image issues and trying to get into some of the things of what is driving me to want to change. So what is the reason for me trying to embark on this new type of a diet? What do I think it's going to give me? And when you can kind of start talking through that with people, obviously there's kind of different layers to that. One, there's obviously the, the, the surface layer of 
well, obviously, if you're going to try and change your diet, most people are trying to change their body composition in some way. And then below that, there's a layer of, well, why do they want to do that? They want to look good for X, Y, and Z reasons. But there's probably something even deeper that's going back uh, how long. That can be useful to go through because it kind of gives that person quite a lot of leverage if you go down deeper in those layers. So the deeper you go down to like a true reason of why you're trying to make change, it's probably going to give you more leverage to change rather than just saying, oh, I just want to lose a few pounds. It's not really as strong as getting into the deep reasons why. Uh, the other is probably to evaluate is that change you're seeking really something that's going to make you happy in, in a way you think. Like yeah. so often I've came across people who are, who are like healthy and already lean who don't believe they are lean because we have now this distorted view of what lean means or because of maybe the popularization of bodybuilding or uh, social media and these types of things are kind of people have this skewed view of what lean really is, right? So um, girls coming to you and saying like, I, I just want like these six pack abs that I've seen this person on Instagram have. It's like, yeah, like that is beyond super lean. Like for mm -hmm. a female to have like full on abs, like it's just beyond super lean. Like that's not just a, a healthy body, right? Um, so, and I'm not saying they are not healthy. I'm saying just to be healthy and lean and in good shape and, and metabolically healthy uh, and to look good, you don't need abs at all. And uh, so people have this kind of skewed view of what that is and trying to dig down into why they want a certain goal. Um, and then from there, you can kind of see what their behaviors are like with food um, and why they eat certain ways. And so that would be the first point we I would always try and address. Does this person have a good relationship with food? And if not, how do we improve that? How do we get them to be able to feel freer in their choices, not to feel guilty, not to view foods as good and bad, not to look at things in this black and white way of thinking, to be able to have flexibility to include certain meals and certain occasion, uh, social occasions within any type of dieting strategy. And so that would be a good place to start. And obviously, depending on, on the person and, and how deep that is, uh, your scope of practice would come into play of, do you need to bring someone else in to help with this as well? Or can it be something that can be just talked about and managed that way with some good habits? Um, and generally, why uh, an approach of a flexible approach to dieting can help with something like that. It kind of starts to hopefully over time remove some of those um, inbuilt restrictions that are based around guilt as opposed to anything else. Uh, so that would be my first place to start if, if that answers the question. Hopefully. Yeah. So you really make sure that their relationship with, with food is nice and checked off their their perceptions of their body is, is in a good place. And then you kind of really try to look at what, what their why is for a certain goal and that sort of thing. That's kind of your first starting place. Yeah, because if all those things are messed up and then that person just wants to jump straight into an, a, a diet and like diet down aggressively, then like what is going to happen? Like it's probably going to be not so good. It's mm -hmm. coming from a bad place. Um, psychologically, they're doing it probably for some of the wrong reasons. And then the biggest thing is most people end up realizing is that if they were already unhappy with a number of things before then, and then they diet down and, and get leaner, it doesn't suddenly make this happy life that they probably had presumed. Mm -hmm. So trying to dig down into, like I said, what do they think they're going to achieve when they get to a certain point? And if it's that they think there's some sort of magical happiness at getting like super shredded, it's probably not the case. There's some other things we can talk about. And that's not to say getting, getting lean and shredded is not a good goal for some people. And mm -hmm. sure people really enjoy it and will feel good. And if someone is overweight and loses weight, they're going to be happier and more confident and all that right. type of stuff. But doing it from a good place of knowing the uh, benefits it can bring them as opposed to doing it from a place of fear and anxiousness about uh, how bad they feel about themselves and how guilty they feel for eating a certain type of food. That's the kind of difference of doing it for these positive it's going to bring as opposed to doing it for uh, negatives that you feel about yourself, I guess. So making sure to start out of a point of, of strength rather than kind of starting out a, at a weak point to where maybe they're just pretty insecure with where they're at and doing that sort of thing. And, you know, part of me, part of me kind of sees the other side too, to where maybe you want to manage these expectations of like how, how you're going to change yourself. But 
you think that it could also be demotivating for people to always have like, I don't know, someone kind of managing their expectations of getting lean and that sort of thing? Because I know if some people realized like after they've become an intermediate lifter, how long it might take to put on another five, 10 pounds of muscle, that might be like, oh, just a total shot. And if they were mm. like ignorance is bliss is kind of the the term that I kind of see there. So you kind of understand right. what I've tried to ramble through here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's two things. One is that I I do see uh, on the flip side of what I've said that doing it, it's not I'm not making a case for someone should just always be kind of happy where they're at and never do something to to change themselves. That's in fact the opposite. Most of the time, these beneficial changes people can happen is coming from a place of dissatisfaction with a certain aspect. So they're either unhappy with their health status, unhappy with their current body composition, their fitness levels, and so on. And that's the thing that's going to drive them to make change. I think that's totally beneficial. And I don't think it's something that we need to go against. The difference is that once that's the case, and they're saying, okay, I'm dissatisfied with this area, I want to change it. Now, instead of constantly uh, beating themselves up about it, or again, going into these restrictive mindsets of like good and bad foods or I've messed up and all this type of stuff instead going into, um, how can we focus on the process to get them in the right direction? And this kind of ties into the point you were making, uh, in the latter part of what you said is that we really should try and move to a process orientated, um, kind of way of programming as opposed to completely outcome based. And outcome-based goals tend to be not that useful, in my opinion, for most of the time. So sure, you might want to have some long, lofty goal of lifting a certain number or winning a certain championship or losing X amount of weight. But on a day-to-day basis of actually getting there, they're almost worthless. Those goals don't uh, give you anything actionable to work with. So instead, focusing on what is the process to likely get in that direction and do that and judge your progress on are you doing those behaviors and habits each day and so in this case if rather than getting someone to focus on hey you, you only, you're only going to be able to put on like two pounds of muscle in this next year and them getting demotivated it's that it's okay you want to build more muscle here's what that process looks like here's what your next mesocycle looks like and here's the kind of next training week here's what i want you to execute in each of those training sessions and now they're focusing on those things and where they end up is where they're going to end up. Because by changing your goal, you can actually change how much muscle you're going to build to that process. So if we have a six-month training block for someone to, to build muscle, and their goal is to put on 10 pounds versus their goal to put on four pounds, that goal doesn't change what they're going to put on. Mm-hmm. What will change it, though, is the process they follow. So they can modify that. So we can focus on here's the process you need to follow to build more muscle. Do this as best you can. Uh, the more we're able to stick closely to this rough plan, the, the higher the likelihood we're going to build as much muscle as you possibly can. And whether that for that person ends up being one pound or 10 pounds, we don't really have as much control over. So that's where I would frame it of instead of trying to temper down their expectations by giving them different outcomes, just almost move away from that and say, okay, that's cool. You want to lose a bunch of weight? We, we'll, we'll get you moving in the right direction. We know what to do. Here's what this process looks like. We're going to evaluate however many weeks and then just ride out from there um, as opposed to saying, okay, in a year from now, I want you to weigh X number of pounds. Right. So instead of like totally hitting them with, hey man, it's not possible for you to build 20 pounds of muscle over this next 10 month period. It's more so, okay, the goal is to build muscle as, as maximally as we can. So let's focus on the day-to-day, week-to-week things that we can do to kind of get us moving towards that goal. Right. Yeah. And I mean, if you have, say, that, that year time frame with someone, most of the time, these numbers that they have given themselves are completely arbitrary, right? Like mm-hmm. they don't know what they're going to look like with 20 pounds of muscle versus eight pounds of muscle. And in fact, if they only built three pounds of lean muscle, they would look different and they would be happy with that. But people don't, it doesn't seem a lot. So 
you can, yeah, you say to him, yeah, you want to get jacked? Yeah, let's get you as jacked as we can. And like that gets him super pumped. And you say, yeah, we're going to get you jacked out your mind. Here's the process to follow. You're going to have to do this. It's going to take this length of time, but let's follow through on this. And then if they're doing that consistently for six months, they're going to look a lot better and they're going to be bigger. Mm -hmm. They're not going to turn around to you and say, hey, you lied to me. I've only put on two pounds and uh, I, I wanted four. Right? They're just like, they're going to look better. They're like, that's going to be good. They're going to stay doing that. And so, yeah, just shifting away from these arbitrary numbers. Like the same happens with weight loss. People have these arbitrary numbers of, I want to lose like 10 pounds. It's like, they, it doesn't relate anything in their head of what they look like. 10 pounds less versus 8 pounds less versus 12 pounds less. So the process is let's get you being able to first lose that weight consistently in a manner that's going to be productive and let's let you keep sticking to those new behaviors and habits and keep progressing. And where you are in six weeks, then great. And then if we want to go a bit faster or slower, we can. But we don't need, like they're not making weight for a competition. You don't need a specific number. And uh, so yeah, the process is going to be more important than how many pounds they've lost after eight weeks, right? Yeah, I, I totally like that approach to where it's less focused on an exact, like you said, it's, it's arbitrary anyways. So it's kind of pointless to focus on yeah. that sort of thing and just kind of understand that when they say that, they're just saying that they want to build muscle and look better or they want to lose yep. some fat to look better. It's not necessarily, yeah. I automatically have to lose X amount of weight. Right, yeah, I get it all the time. So many athletes, you get a lot of endurance athletes saying, "Look, I want to get down to like eight percent body fat." It's like, what does that even mean? Like, do you? <laughs> how do you know what you are now? Like, like it's it's so arbitrary. A lot of these numbers that they've probably read somewhere that someone else tries to get this, this certain number, um, and really, it's like let's just progress through this process, and then the outcome will take care of itself. Um, and sure, for some people, there may be a certain goal weight that you want to get to but it's, you still can't have know the exact day they're going to hit it, right? So if mm -hmm. we want to get um, a cyclist down to like 69 kilos, I apologize, my conversion to pounds isn't so good, but say we're dieting down to like 69 kilos um, and we can get them there over a rough approximate time span that we can map out based on how much of a deficit we're going to put them in, but we don't know exactly what day in six weeks from now they're going to hit that number mm -hmm. right like it, their weight can fluctuate up and down all this type of stuff how they're going to respond but we know we'll get there in a rough time frame but it's not as exact lose x amount of pounds as soon as possible right and for on the individual level it's going to be impossible to really estimate that anyways because the yes you can control for energy in but eating less then you might mess that the energy out part of the thing. So some people may eat a little bit less and automatically their energy out might decrease. And then your estimations for rate of weight loss is going to be skewed anyway. So I like the yeah. approach of doing that sort of thing. Yeah. You, you, you just can't plan that out. And like, it's, it's quite clear if this whole idea, if you drop someone's calories by 500, they're predicted they're going to lose exactly a pound every week. And then you count back from there, like just nonsense doesn't work mm -hmm. that way. Each person, even people that, are in the exact same position, uh, say they're the same body weight, same age, same gender, same training program, maybe even the same number of maintenance calories. You drop both those people by the same number of calories, their weight loss response is different because like you said, their energy expenditure changes. Those metabolic adaptations are different mm -hmm. from one person to the next. And so it takes some tweaking over time. So it just shows it's not as exact, but the goal is to have a rough average, say weight loss rate that we want per week and over time that it's generally trending in that direction and get you moving and if someone is progressing then they're going to be happy um, and if we want to progress a bit faster we can but that's the the goal is to be able to get them moving not to be super sucked in by a specific number yep for sure and the very last thing i have here is oh uh little page out of the Sigma Nutrition Radio. So, Danny, if you could recommend one thing for people to do each day, doesn't necessarily have to be about what we talked about today, what would your one thing be? Oh, man, yeah. This is a, as I was going to say, my, my mind probably changes quite a lot uh, uh -huh. on this, and I go back and forth because of so many different things and depending on that time. But I, I would say... 
um, and kind of, it actually does fit in with something we talked about earlier, is just being very cognizant of your social interaction and your uh, social relationship. And I think it's very easy now for a lot of us to neglect some of that, not even purposely, but I mean, it's uh, especially like, like for ex if example, with me, uh, I work online, I can kind of work from anywhere. Um, I'm very comfortable uh, with myself. I, I don't mind spending time alone, things like that. Um, generally, I would say I'm a, quite an introverted person, uh, good socially, but naturally an introvert in terms of like, I get quite drained energy wise from like constant social mm -hmm. interactions. So forcing yourself to be able to make sure you stay connected with the people that matter to you, make sure that you're touching base with them, making sure you're taking time to hang out with certain friends, putting yourself in, in groups that you feel that kind of sense of belonging that we talked about earlier. Uh, and those kind of key things of like community support and feeling of belonging, try and get yourself in positions where you're going to feel those. Um, and sometimes it has to be a kind of conscious effort to remind yourself to do that. It's like, when was the last time I called this person or, or just sent a message to this person or said, Hey, do you want to meet up for a coffee? Um, or went to, uh, make sure I'm in a group that I feel this kind of sense of belonging with. And if, you don't have those things right now. That that's cool. You you can kind of start making steps towards those things. Um, so that's probably where I'd start because of just how much benefit there is from that kind of social interaction and a lack of social isolation. I guess. Yeah, I I really like that and totally agree. That's really well said. So where where can people find you? You know, six sigma sig sigma nutrition radio dot com. They can find your podcast and things like that. Where else can people kind of find your stuff, Danny? Yeah, so pretty much everything will be on the website. So yeah, just sigmanutrition.com. You can see the podcast, we have articles, uh, our, our coaching service. Uh, we have some other educational resources all up there. Uh, social media-wise, I'm um, on Instagram, as much as I gave out about it today. So <laughs> Danny Lennon underscore Sigma. Uh, and when you're there, you'll probably see my kind of posting frequency kind of is in line with what I said. Uh, Twitter, Nutrition Danny. And then uh, Facebook, they can either find Sig Nutrition or my own personal page. So any of those places, I'm happy to take questions. Um, and yeah, just have a look around the website and see if anything is of interest. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. I enjoyed this. Thank you so much for listening to this. Make sure to go check out Danny's stuff. Check out my stuff at ryanjsolomon.com. And I'll see you in that next one.